Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a crazy time we're living in right now. You know, it's real easy with all the stuff that's going on to feel helpless, depressed, overwhelmed, anxious, or even fearful right now. The fact of the matter is, is that we are so vulnerable as people. We can lose our life at any time. It's a reality. It's always been a reality, but for so many people right now, it's just right there in our face. Uh, George Floyd lost his life in nine minutes in Minneapolis. A hundred thousand people have died from the coronavirus. These are unsettling times. So before I get into today's message, let me just take a minute and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, we, we see our vulnerability. We see our weakness. We see the brokenness and fallenness of this world, oh Lord. So we just ask for your presence to uh, just overwhelm us, for your spirit to just pour into us so greatly and so deeply that we overflow with it, oh God. We pray for the brokenness um, in our society, oh God. We pray um, for uh, the folks um, who have lost loved ones. We pray for the uh, civil unrest and um, um, the, the challenges happening right now in our country, oh Lord. Uh, so we just pray for reconciliation. And we pray to be used by you uh, for your glory and your kingdom. You know, with all this uh, different stuff going on, George Floyd, uh, the coronavirus, uh, right now there, there's rioting. Um, you know, with all this stuff, there's two things that we should really be looking at. There's two things we be, should be striving for. The first is to cling to Jesus in these, in these difficult times. Jesus is the only solid thing that we can actually hold on to. He's the only thing that can give us peace that surpasses all understanding. We have to put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus because if it's placed anywhere else, it is misplaced. It's in the wrong place if it's not in Jesus. And the second thing that we should take away when we look at our broken world is that every waking moment we have, every waking moment, we should try to live for Jesus. We should try to follow Jesus because he is the answer to our broken world. He brings justice. He brings peace. Jesus is the cure. Jesus brings reconciliation and he brings healing. You know, as Christians, we have the great antidote for the world's problems. Our world is broken, it's diseased, people are dying, so we need to cling to Jesus and we need to share him with other people because he's the antidote. And today's text, the text we're going to look at today, is great instruction on how to do that how to cling to Jesus, and how to share Jesus. We've been in 1 Peter, I think, for the past five weeks. And today, the text we're going to look at is a very hard text. It's, a, it's especially a hard text for people who have problems with authority like I do. You know, I like to push boundaries. I don't like to follow rules. And I wish I could uh, look at this text and easily explain it away. Um, easily justify why it doesn't really apply to me that much in our current day context. But it's the Bible. It's God's word. It's the truth. And if we want to be followers of Jesus, we have to submit ourselves to God's word and Christ's teachings, whether we like it or not. And this is one of those texts for me where, where it makes me a little uncomfortable um, it pushes me out of my comfort zone, out of the things that I would like to do. So let's take a look at today's scripture. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. The entire scripture section is uh, verses 13 to 25. 
But first, uh, I'm going to break it down into two separate sections. We're going to look at uh, verses 13 to 17 first. Then we're going to look at verses 18 to 25. So let me read this first uh, scripture section. It says, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. It says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The word of the Lord. You know, the first thing that we have to remember when we read this text is something that uh, Brian talked about several weeks ago. First Peter is written to Christians who are living in exile. They're living in a foreign land under rulers um, that aren't Christians. Uh, they're living in a place with rules and regulations that they probably don't like. Uh, they're living in uncomfortable situations. And they're living under institutions that don't believe the same things they believe. They don't practice the same things that they practice. Yet still, Peter calls them to be subject or to be submissive. It says, uh, you know, for, for the Lord's sake, be submissive to every human institution. You know, um, it seems like it's a pretty blanket or flat statement, you know, be submissive to human institutions. So we have to look at other parts of Scripture, at other parts of the Bible, to really get an understanding of what is the teaching there. Is this an absolute that in every circumstance, no matter what, we are subject and submissive to human institutions? Or is it like some other parts of the Bible where um, there, there's, um, it, it's contextual. It's about a specific type of circumstance. So let's look at uh, um, uh, some other scripture to kind of learn more what Peter's getting at here. What we're going to look at is um, an example in the New Testament. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 18 to 20. Acts 4, verses 18 to 20. Here, this is where Peter and John were actually arrested and brought before the high priest. And the high priest condemned them and told them to stop telling people about Jesus. They said, stop teaching people about Jesus. Uh, so chapter 4, uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, it says, So they called them, and the so, uh, or the they there is the high priest, so they called them and they charged them, the them is John and Peter, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. It says, but Peter and John answered them. They said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak of what we have seen and heard. Look, right here in this text, we don't see Peter and John fighting the high priest. We don't see them disrespecting the high priest. They submitted to the high priest except for the things that God had expressly told them they should do, right? They told the high priest, they said, listen, as the institution, as the human institution, you have to judge us, but we will listen to God and speak of what we have seen and heard. So they were submissive. Really looks like they were respectful. But they were going to follow what God told them to do. So, 1 Peter chapter 2 in mind. Looking at Acts chapter 4. Um, you know, kind of round out that picture. We see that we should be submissive to every human institution 
unless it is what God has told us to do, right? You know, in that circumstance, in the circumstance where God told us to do something different than the human institution, we still treat people with dignity and respect. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, we learn that this type of conduct, this submissiveness, is all about following Christ, right? It's about following Christ and sharing him with others, right? Clinging to Christ and sharing him with others. It says, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, it says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live, verse 16, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. In Christ, we are free. In Christ, you are free. And by doing good, by doing good to human institutions and others, we silence people that do not know Jesus. We silence fools. We silence people who are hard-hearted when we do these things for Christ. When we are good to human institutions, we follow institutions, we're submissive. We help win people to Christ. It's a way of sharing the gospel. We saw this in the human, in the civil rights movement. You know, in the 60s, one of the things that made the civil rights movement so effective was the abuse that innocent protesters took, and they didn't retaliate. They didn't retaliate with violence, or they didn't retaliate with disrespect. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King really led the way in that. So we saw that, we, we've seen this um, not only in Scripture. We see, you know, with Peter and John, uh, Acts chapter 4, they're let go, and they continue to preach the gospel. We see this um, in the Civil Rights Movement. And this brings us to the second half of our scripture for today, verses 18 through 25. It gets a little uh, deeper, a little bit more personal, a little bit more challenging even. You know, and as we read this, we, um, the second half, verses 18 to 25, we have to remember that Peter is writing to that community, a community of Christians who are foreigners and exiles in a different land. They are spiritually free through their faith in Jesus Christ. However, this next section is addressed to a particular group in that community. It's addressed to people who are literally slaves. They're literally owned by other people. These are Christian slaves. And so Peter is, um, in 18 through 25, he's addressing them. It says, Servants or slaves, depends on uh, the translation. It says, uh, Slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to do the good and gentle, but also not only, um, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you." leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body, on the tree, that we might die to sin 
and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word of the Lord. You know, in this section, Peter is instructing slaves to be submissive to their masters, no matter how harsh they're being treated. However, however, let's be clear, Peter is not giving any validation of harsh treatment by slave masters. He's not telling slave masters, you should treat your slaves harshly. Also, Peter's instruction is not an endorsement of slavery. He's not saying slavery is a, is a good and right and just system, right? It's not saying that. And it's not saying slaves are weaker or any less of a person than their masters. It's, it's not saying that either. Peter is simply saying to slaves who he's addressing directly to be peaceful and submissive even in the face of the harshest treatment. Because doing that is Christ-like. Doing that is Christ-like. That's what Christ did going to the cross. And it's a sign, it's a symbol of genuine Christian faith. In verse 21 it says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. Wow. You know, that, that's some serious stuff right there, verse 21. It teaches us that sometimes we are called to horrible things and horrible situations. Verse 21 tells us, for, the, for to this, he's talking to slaves, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. You know, with Christ as our example, when we cling to him, when we follow him, we can get through these things and lead others to salvation, right? You know, um, what's, what's the point? We could, uh, you know, get through these things and, and, and just suffer. You know, that, that's not the point. It's to get through these things and lead others to salvation. You know, Peter, in this uh, section, he is focusing on, on the inspirational aspect, the inspirational aspect of suffering that we can have on others when we go through difficult times. We can help lead people to Christ. We can have this impact when we're suffering, when we're submissive, when we're obedient, when we sacrifice for Christ, we can lead others for him. Because that's what our Lord and Savior did. That's what Jesus did. As Christians, he calls us to do that for others. He calls us to be examples for others. That's what he does. That's what Christ does. But you know, one of the things that confuses me here or perplexes me here is why doesn't the Bible just call out and condemn the practice of slavery right here, right? Why does it just say, hey, slavery is wrong. You're living in that situation right now. It could be a great glory to God, but it's just wrong, and it should be abolished. You know, if the Bible did that, we wouldn't have to argue with people or hear arguments from people who bash the Bible and say that it condones slavery, right? Right? You know, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's heard that before. It's a bad argument. It's usually said by people who haven't read the Bible in its entirety or haven't studied Scripture. But people say that. So it would have been really convenient for us, especially today in apologetics and evangelism, if it just said that, right? 
you know, would make God's position on slavery really super plain and simple. But since the Bible doesn't pop out right here and say slavery is bad, I want to pause for a second and kind of um, unpack that a little bit. Kind of uh, explore the Bible's position on slavery a little more in depth. And, you know, to do that, we have to read 1 Peter chapter 2 alongside the book of Philemon. You know, this is where um, Onesimus, uh, the slave, is sent back by Paul to Philemon, the slave owner. And um, in, in the letter of Philemon, uh, the, Paul writes to the slave owner, who, Philemon, who's the slave owner. He says, on the basis of love, take back Onesimus, right? It says, welcome back Onesimus on the basis of love. That's verse 4 or verse 9 in uh, Philemon. And it says also in Philemon, verse 16, to welcome him as a brother, right? So here's a slave owner, and Paul's telling him to take him back on the basis of love and treat him like a brother. Don't treat him like a slave, treat him like a brother. So, well, 1 Peter chapter 2 seems to only challenge the slave to be submissive, in Philemon, we see the slave owner also being challenged and confronted as well. So the New Testament writers are actually challenging slavery from every aspect, from the slave and also from the owner. You know, just the concept of slavery, they're challenging it. And they're calling each, each of those to respond to that relationship, to respond to each other in a new way, in a way that reflects Jesus Christ, in a way that reflects being brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the New Testament writers, they give a new definition of what it means to, um, of how Christianity, of how being a follower of Christ defines relationships. It puts us into a familial relationship. And in a familial relationship, in a, in, in a family, there's not a slave, right? So um, it doesn't come out and clearly say it in modern day English. But when you read the New Testament in general, you see that slavery, injustice, is, is challenged from every side and every perspective, right? But he also shows us, right? He also shows us, Christ does, that um, we need to come against evil and oppression, but in a subversive way, right? Not in a way where um, uh, it's, it's, oh, it's disrespectful, not in a way where um, it's degrading, but in a subversive way. We need to conduct ourselves in a way that's above reproach, right? as individuals. And even and even a lot of the war treaties we have nowadays, they're based off of these principles of, of, of doing things in, in the best possible way, right? Um, and so uh, scripture, scripture has had a tremendous impact. And when we read scripture and we, we follow Christ's teaching in the in, in um, even the hardest circumstance, imagine being a slave and hearing this. Be submissive no matter how harsh or mean your owner is to you. Be submissive and treat them with dignity and respect. That's a hard teaching. You know, it's a really hard teaching to come against evil and oppression in a subversive way. In a, in a serving way, to come against it through love and sacrifice and servanthood. You know, in all of this, in all of this, uh, First, Peter, First Peter chapter 2, Philemon, um, all of Jesus' teaching, he is redefining what is real authority and real power. 
Where does that come from? It's, it's not a kingdom of the world perspective. It's a kingdom of God perspective. Jesus respected the authorities of earth, and he called his followers to be in submission to those leaders and offices. But they're not the highest authority. It's Christ. It's Christ and God's kingdom. Christ also shows that through his teachings, um, uh, through his own life, that the real authority and the real power come when we willingly give up those, those rights and positions and privileges for him. You know, earlier on in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, it says we're free, right? But if you then, if you're free and you submit yourselves, you're giving up that freedom. But you're not just giving up that freedom um, uh, as a, as, you know, because of weakness. You're giving it up be, uh, for for the true power and authority of Jesus Christ. It's a tried and true way to share the gospel and bring transformation. You know, we see this through the New Testament. This is what the early Christians did. Peter and John. We're seeing it right here. Peter writing it to uh, Christians who are exiled. You know, God does not condone injustice. He doesn't condone racism. He doesn't condone slavery. But in this broken world, these things exist. Christ calls us to follow him above everything else. And part of following Christ is submissiveness. Submissiveness First and foremost, to Him, to Christ, to God, but also submissiveness to human institutions. Except, except for when it goes against God's commands, right? We saw that in Acts chapter 4. Another example of that is Daniel, when he was told to worship the king and not pray to any other gods but the king. He still prayed to God and he was obedient to God, but not in a disrespectful way, not in a dishonoring way. When we suffer well and we serve well for Jesus, we share the gospel. We need to share it with words, but when we suffer well and serve well, we're also sharing the gospel. So in closing, I want to encourage you to cling to Jesus in this broken world because he is the only thing you can hold on to. He's the only thing that will give you the peace that surpasses on all understanding and help you get through these difficult times. And I want to encourage you to follow him, follow Christ and his example. He is the answer to the brokenness in the world. He is the answer to the problems that we're seeing. Share him through word and deed. Share Christ in your strength and share him in your suffering. Share him through service. Share him through submissiveness. Life is fleeting. Don't waste your time on earth trying to hold on to strength and power you don't really have. Christ is above all. He's the end all, be all. Follow Christ and his example.